Electric cars may seem like the future of the automotive industry today, but as far back as the 1800s, it actually seemed like electric vehicles were already the common sense option. The distinct benefits of electric vehicles seemed abundantly clear to many of the time, as well as the inherent flaws of the fossil fuel engine. By the time the first car show in America premiered at Madison Square Garden in New York City in the year 1900, over a third of the 160 vehicles on display were electric. Although the technology required to push electric vehicles to the forefront of the consumer vehicle marketplace seemingly was able to be developed far quicker than its gasoline counterpart, one man would change everything. Putting electric-powered cars back into the realm of futuristic science fiction technology for nearly 100 years. This is the story behind the electric vehicle's inception. And this is Learn Something New. When Scottish inventor Robert Anderson created the first electric-powered horseless carriage, it was remarkably simplistic. He took a primitive battery and a motor and attached them to a carriage that horses were typically supposed to pull. Despite this happening as far back as 1832, it worked. But unlike one of the major forces for the development and adoption of the technology today, this method was far from environmentally friendly and free of fossil fuels. The electric current stored in the battery he used was generated using crude oil, but it was also a single-use battery. As soon as it was empty, you needed another one. Although the carriage was able to move simply using the power generated from the battery, it was completely infeasible for any form of transportation at this point. The motor lacked the necessary power, and the battery lacked the necessary longevity. And also worth mentioning once again, it was just a one-time use battery. The next big leap forward in the technology wouldn't occur until 1859, when Gaston Plant successfully developed the very first rechargeable battery. The battery has almost always been the most crucial part of the development of electric vehicles. It's the linchpin which the technology hinges on. So when the French chemist presented a lead-acid battery that could deliver a stronger flow of electrons from a higher capacity storage, he shocked those around him, demonstrating that the flow of electrons could then be reversed, recharging the battery from an electric source multiple times over. It was an incredibly valuable advancement which laid the foundation for the decades to come. But despite this, Plant's battery was notably fairly useless when it came to electric vehicles. The bulky, heavy battery weighed far too much for early vehicles to use, when weaker motors and smaller charges meant that weight had an outsized impact on the feasibility of the vehicle. But just five years before Carl Benz would file his 1886 patent for the first gasoline-powered car, another significant advancement was made to battery technology that would bring the electric car to reality. Camille Faure, yet a Another French chemist dedicated himself to the improvement of the revolutionary lead-acid battery after working for years as a chemical engineer at the Cotton Powder Company in England, making high-yield explosives and detonators. A trip to the Paris Exposition of 1878 gave Ferre the idea that would lead to him using lead plates coated with paste oxides, sulfuric acid, and water, which were then cured. This design greatly improved upon plants, allowing for a higher capacity charge packed into a significantly smaller package. Not only could these batteries fit onto a carriage, but several of them could be installed with a manageable impact to the carriage's performance. And after the new battery made its debut, a carriage maker based out of Paris would jump at the opportunity to put it to the test, crafting custom buggies using the batteries. By 1883, he was able to start selling the electric-powered vehicles, still three years before the first gas-powered vehicle came to fruition, though he wouldn't really be able to mass-produce them until 1893. Speaking of 1893, it was in this same year that the electric car came to America, with a Scottish immigrant, William Morrison, who had made his new home in Des Moines, Iowa, bringing his version of the vehicle to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, also referred to as the World's Columbian Exhibition. Morrison had been working in a lab in the basement of a local jewelry store to improve upon battery weights of the time, and once satisfied with his lightweight battery, he used it to start the Des Moines Buggy Company, which had an electric motor powering just one wheel of the carriage. Notably, at the World's Fair, there was only one other automobile on display, a gas-powered quadricycle, making it truly seem as though the future of transportation could go either way. 
This wouldn't be the end of the advancements to early electric vehicles either, as the very next year, Louis Antony Krieger, back in France, managed to incorporate the very first regenerative braking system, which allowed the rotation of the wheel of the vehicle to recharge the battery whenever it went downhill. It was promising technology like this that made the electric vehicle seem like it was the better choice to use. By 1897, New York City jumped at the opportunity to propel itself into the future. Prior to this point, Manhattan was generating a lot of poop. As the 150 horses used for transportation took people from point A to B throughout the day, each horse could excrete dozens of pounds of excrement daily. The city knew that as they were growing, vehicles could provide a cleaner form of travel that had the potential to not only replace horses, but perform even better than the horses had as the technology improved. So a taxi service was formed. But when looking at whether to use electric or gas-powered cars, the choice seemed obvious. In those days, gas-powered vehicles had to start using a crank that was attached to the engine at the front of the vehicle. It was difficult and sometimes it just didn't work. Even when it did, the engines tended to be loud and put off a foul-smelling emission. Electric vehicles, on the other hand, started with the flip of a switch and moved silently through the streets. Whenever the battery of an electric-powered taxi was low, they would just bring it back into the shop and replace the battery with a fully charged one, getting the vehicle right back out onto the streets. It really didn't matter if the battery could only go 25 miles on a single charge when they were able to replace the battery more quickly than the time it would take to swap out a horse. By 1899, the Manhattan Taxi Cab Service had grown to over 100 vehicles, but it didn't mean that things were going perfectly. In May of that year, one cab driver was arrested for speeding down the street at 12 miles per hour, far too quick for the local ordinances. A few weeks later, one of the quiet electric taxis struck and killed a man as he crossed the street. In fact, it wasn't the technology that would bring an end to the New York City taxi service, but rather poor management. As the electric vehicle company, which had been sourcing the taxis, tried to expand beyond the Big Apple, its mismanagement became clear. Poor operations management, along with the news of the company fraudulently securing a loan and subsequently pulling out, meant that the company was left nearly bankrupt as soon as 1902. Corruption came to a head when a fire in 1907 destroyed a large portion of the vehicles in New York City. Despite the push for the electric car, it was ultimately Henry Ford's Model T that dealt the final blow to its longevity. With Ford's mass production assembly line techniques, the gas-powered vehicle managed to get its cost down to a mere $650, far below other vehicles of the time, which were selling for around $1,750. With advancements like electric starters eliminating the need for the hand crank and gas becoming more readily available around the country, electric vehicles saw less investment into the technology, as well as less public interest and fewer viable options for those interested in the vehicles. And this would last for nearly 100 years. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel so that you can see more videos like this one. If you want to further support the channel, please consider checking out the channel Patreon, linked below in the description. Thank you so much to the patrons who continue making these videos possible, and thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.